Um, glad glad to be back. I've been uh, I've been thinking about this one since our last uh, webinar. It was it was one of the it was one of the uh, comments that somebody had made um, uh, in the last the last uh, I want to call it a workshop the last webinar. That, that prompted this and I'm, I've been excited to talk about this. So, so if you haven't seen the last one, um, catch it because this kind of builds on, so we talked last time about what sharing feelings is and is not. Um, we're gonna talk about what validation is and is not. Um, this, this is another one of those, I think common fights that I see and that's that's what somebody had brought up last time in the, the Q and A um, that, uh, they often got into to fights with their partner um, about whether validation was happening or not. So there's there's two main ways that I can see the term validate being used. And I think they're actually both useful relationally. They just they need really different things. They open up really different paths. So the first way is the more legalistic term. To validate means to prove that something is true or authentic. And the second way that I see the uh, term used is uh, to prove or confirm that a person is valuable or worthwhile. So think here branches on a decision tree and um, really think about when, when you run into these validation issues, um, think about what kind of validation you're actually going for, what kind of validation is actually needed. Uh, like I said, I think both of them have a really big, um, a big role in healthy relationships. They're just they're just not the same thing. They can't be treated the same way. So let's let's tackle um, let's tackle each of these uh, paradigms. Um, I, I think that wires often get crossed. We we misperceive or we we try one set of validation skills um, for the other kinds uh, presenting issues, and wires get crossed and. Lots of relational uh, dissatisfaction ensues. So let's tackle the first definition. Um, the truth of emotions um, or the validity of emotions, I would say, is self-evident. If you're feeling it, that feeling is real. Um, whether or not the premise or whether or not how you arrived at that motion is uh, certifiably true or not, that's not how emotions work. Emotions are not based on facts. In fact, um, it's a completely different system in our neurology and our brain, how we arrive at logical conclusions and how we arrive at emotional conclusions. And both of them are, are, are valid. Despite what our um, culture might teach, um, logic is not greater than emotion. Um, and, and the inverse is true. Emotion is not greater than logic. They're, they're different. Um, different ways of knowing, um, some would say, and, and uh, being in touch with both are really important. So um, whether or not uh, the emotion makes sense in the observable context is another matter. So this, this is where I see a lot of like, why can't you validate my feelings? Um, why can't you tell me they're true? Um, a lot of times, uh, objectively, legitimately, a partner may struggle. What you're feeling does not make sense to me right now. I can't see the connection between what I perceive just happened and how you're feeling. That's not to say that the feeling is out there in no man's land and it doesn't, it doesn't connect at all. I think every feeling connects to the situations that bring them up. It's just we often have to do some work to get under the surface um, beyond what is observable um, to make sense. So, um, Call back to the last webinar, um, justifying your feelings doesn't prove that they're right or not, because feelings are completely subjective. So that's the point. If if you need validation in the first in the in the in the first sense of the word, the proving that it's true or authentic, um, that actually can't come from another person. Because that other person doesn't have access to all the data you do. Um, so um, I see a lot of fights where one partner wants validation for their intention or efforts. Can't you see that I'm trying? Um, I get no credit. Um, why can't you see past my, my past mistakes? In other words, give me credit for what I'm doing right now. Um, I think is, those are all calls for 
Why can't you validate my efforts or my intention right now? So I go back to that question, who can actually validate, who can actually provide proof for the first form of validation? I think it's the person who's seeking it. So if I'm telling you, hey, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, um, you know, and what I said, just give me the benefit of the doubt. I, I actually think that maneuver, that outside maneuver right there wipes away any authenticity or truth to what you're saying. I'm not trying to hurt you. Or I don't want to hurt you. If I keep doggedly going after that, just give me credit, just, you know, get some thick skin. That's not showing that I'm going for sensitivity towards your feelings. So a lot of times validation in the first sense, it cannot be immediately given. It can't be immediately proven, especially when it comes to relationships. The validation of here's my intent is often borne out more over time. So by that, I mean, let's say that I say something insensitive. We're having an emotionally charged, important conversation. I say something insensitive and I say, I didn't mean to hurt you, you know, calm down. Um, I didn't mean to hurt you is fine. I would take the calm down out of there and then focus on what are my actions next? Do they align? Do they prove my intention is actually, I'm not trying to hurt you. I want to help you. I want to be here for you. And um, your, your partner can never, ever validate what you intend. They can never, ever validate what you feel. Only you can. So I would say um, the person projecting the need for validation, which I, I'm not saying that facetiously, there is a real need for that. The person who's projecting that need um, needs to drop the immediacy of that and needs to drop the burden that they put on their partner to prove to me that what I'm feeling is true or prove to me that what I um intend is true it's actually the other way around let me prove to you that what i'm feeling is real for me and what that what that actually looks like is i may hold a boundary around that i'm sad right now and and i i can appreciate your desire to make that stop but this is my feeling and i need to feel it um or again like proving the the intent um i'm not wanting to hurt you so i'm going to prove that intent by acting in a way that is sensitive and not damaging or I'll apologize when there is damage and I'll soften. Um, so the second definition is to confirm that a person is valuable or worthwhile. Notice what that doesn't focus on. It does not focus on what's said. It doesn't focus on what, what is felt. It focuses on the person themselves. So in the second sense of the word invalidation, I would argue that you could throw away what you're saying, what you're feeling. That's not the point. If I'm to validate you as a person, I focus on you as a person. Um, validation has nothing to do with what someone says or believes. Just look at our larger culture, our larger world right now that is so polarized and how easy it is to cancel or throw someone away because we don't like what they're saying or what they believe. Um, that's what's easy. And I think it's super damaging. Like you can see it in our culture. You can, you can see these insurmountable divisions seemingly insurmountable divisions, um, because when we place a person's worth, when we place a person's value on what they believe or say, um, you're always going to be garbage to somebody, which I think is a really, really uh, damaging um, state in the human condition to know that I'm garbage or to feel that I'm garbage. So when you're looking at validation of a person, let's break it down. And I want to start with the very most basic form of validation or the first form of validation we get. Um, I learned about this in graduate school as I was studying um, like the development of personality and um, where our sense of security and our attachment style comes from. Um, this is called eye to eye validation. And this is what the parent or caregiver does with the infant. It's just this looking, I see you. Um, you, you matter, I'm responsive. So, you know, when, when baby's upset and gets that furrowed brow and that downturned face, eye to eye validation, although this would be beyond eye to eye and you could call it more like eye to face validation. The baby starts to feel sad and I show you, I see that, oh no, you're sad. Um, that's that's the most basic form of validation. There's the building block, I see you. And like all things developmental, I don't think we graduate or grow out of. So a lot of validating a person 
is again, I, I would argue is looking beyond what they're saying and what they're believing and look at them as a person. I see you right now, you're really upset. You're really mad. You really feel mistreated. Um, perspective taking would be another part of that basic validation. I could see in your shoes, I could see where you're coming from, um, how that feeling is true. I can see why you feel that way. Just a couple of weeks ago, our family had a big, uh, it was a big moment in our family, a big uh, heart to heart. And it, it started with um, some discipline that we needed to give our older boys. And at the end of that discipline conversation, I said, I want you all to know, uh, I want you both to know, we don't think you're bad kids. We think you're really great kids. And my oldest welled up with tears and he said, I wish you would show that more. And then we went on to have a conversation about how things have been feeling in the family. And, you know, at one point he said something to me, like, I don't feel like you make an effort to spend time with me. And inside my eyes rolled inside. I was like, I know that's not true because I've been doing just the opposite. I've been making a huge effort to spend good time with you. And I could give you five examples from the last two days. But again, in that moment, it's not about, he, he doesn't need anyone to authenticate the truth of what he's saying. He's having a feeling. In the moment, he looked past that and I said something like, um, I don't know, tell me more or something like, um, yeah, I can see, I can see how tough that's been. I'm really sorry. The validation of the person more important than validation of the words or the facts that are being presented. And I would say that's often the case when somebody is sharing something with you. So another way that that validation can happen is you can acknowledge the risks taken and the vulnerability. I know that takes a lot for you to talk to me that directly, or I know that takes a lot for you to share those feelings. Um, I want you to know that I see that or I appreciate that. Um, validation and agreement are not the same thing. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, a confirmation is another way that you can provide validation. What you're feeling and saying or going through matters to me because it's you. And again, inside and sometimes outside, we need to say this, whether I agree with you not or not is not what's important to hear here. What matters is somebody that I love, somebody that I care about is hurting or coming to me for help and um, I value that. I value you. Let's let's slow this down. Let's keep talking this through. Or or even I think it can be really validating to say something like, I don't, I don't know what to do, but I'm here with you. We'll figure it out together. Um, so like I said before, validation is not agreement. And I I think in some, I don't say this with judgment. I think it's just a description in some immature emotional states. We may not be able to feel a difference between those two. How could you validate me if you don't agree with me? Um, and I, I think that is, that's a losing premise for both parties. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a miracle to get two people to fully agree on anything. So number one, that whole, you can only validate me if you agree with me. Candidly, I think it's rather narcissistic. And it's also like, it just doesn't happen in the wild, really. There's always differences. There's always nuances. There's always some degree of separation. So what I would say about that, if you feel differently, that validation must be agreement, um, please talk to your therapist about that. I think there's some work to do. I don't say that in a shaming way. Um, underneath that belief, that if you don't agree with me, you can't validate me, or there's no validation if you don't agree with me. Under that is a is a hurt. It's a really big hurt. I know in the family that I grew up in, um, it wasn't about feelings. It was about what you could prove. And so I would say me and my siblings, we're all really good arguers. We're all really good debaters. Uh, we're not super emotionally connected. Go figure. Um, because it's a, it's a different thing. Um, and... Again, in my family, uh, the family that I grew up in, um, I'd say that's one of the continued struggles. How, how could you say that you're there for me? How could you say you care if you don't agree with me? So um, if, if you're stuck there, 
um, that may have less to do. I'm not saying it's not an issue at all, but that may have less to do with how your partner is validating you. And it may have more to do with what you are expecting in validation. If you need agreement, that's a separate issue. And that's okay if you need agreement. Just don't call it validation. Just like we talked about last time, if you need to share your feelings, don't call your don't call your criticisms feelings. They're not the same thing. Um, so just one one last note on uh, when it comes to to validating or what validating is and is not. I think it's really important here and in a lot of most things relationally to acknowledge and respect your limits. So acknowledge and respect your limits um, as you navigate giving and receiving validation. That might sound something like, it's hard for me to trust right now. Um, you know, that may be your partner who's saying, I'm I'm not trying to hurt you. Could you take it easy? You know what? It's really hard to trust you right now. Um, and I'm, I'm struggling with that. Um, acknowledging your limits might sound like, I need time for this to sink in. Again, these high stakes conversations, we we often go about them with the wrong timeline and the wrong urgency. And don't get me wrong, it's really urgent, but these often are not things that can be resolved in one conversation. So um, give me some time to let me let that sink in. Let me think about what you're saying. Let me think about what we're talking about. I'll, get, I'll come back to you and then keep that promise for sure. Um, I'll need to work on, uh, I'll need to work to understand where you're coming from. Gosh, I think I think about um, some of the most valuable gifts that I've been given in my uh, relationship. That's one of them. I don't get it, but let me work on understanding that. Um, I've tried to give that one too, but um, I, I think that, that that's been one of those counterintuitive forms of validation. There's a part of me that says, I want it and I want it now. And then there's another part of me that says, Oftentimes, it's really difficult stuff. If I get it now, I wouldn't trust it anyway. It actually feels uh, safer. It feels more solid to hear somebody say, I'm going to have to work to wrap my mind around that because it's not coming to me immediately, but I'll, I'll do that and I'll try. Um, oftentimes, um, the acknowledgement or the validation that our partner is asking for um, and here's the wires crossed. They're asking for validation one, which only they can give themselves, uh, in my view. Um, sometimes uh, our, our limit sounds like, I can't give you what you're asking for. Sorry, I can't get on board with that. I've said this before in these, in these webinars that um, if you're going to say no in your relationship, it's, it's a really good practice to follow that up with what you can say yes to. So I, I'm sorry, I can't give you what you're asking for, but I could give, or I would be willing. Um, I, I can't give you agreement. Sorry, I can't sign off on what you're asking me to sign off on, but I can give you a listening ear and continue to hear you. Um, I can give you a place to talk about your feelings. I can get you a drink of water. I can give you space. Um, I can give you my affection. I still love you, even if I don't understand you, even if I don't agree with you. Um, so there's there's lots more to discuss here, but we'll pause there for now. Um, and by the way, Scott, I wanted the, the title of this one to be Do You Validate? Um, yeah. Which is very clever. <laughs> so, I thought so. <laughs> and I will use it. Um, for once, I'm just going to shut the heck up um, because the questions are flying into the Q&A. Um, so let's jump into these. Um, so um, <laughs> um, we are four years into this. The husband is in good recovery, but we are not doing well as a couple and there is zero connection. <laughs> My husband and CSAT keep saying something along, along the lines of, I did not need to know everything that happens in his day that he has to work through, only acting out behaviors. Um, but my heart and gut completely disagree. I want to be let in on his day-to-day -day reality and small struggles that he works through. It builds connection for me and helps build trust, knowing he'll uh, bring the little things to me. But my husband and CSAT think it will just keep me in trauma. Um, I feel that him bringing me into his life and struggles is what's missing from our marriage uh, to feel real connection again. Um, so thoughts here. 
Yeah. Um, couple couple thoughts here. Um, uh, Dr. Adams and I will be presenting this uh, on this uh, part of this talk. Like at the CSAT symposium, we're hoping that we'll uh, in, in the months following up, we'll release some videos widely that talk about this. There, there are some nuances. Uh, if, if your spouse is someone who struggles with uh, enmeshment or in any kind of uh, uh, familial abuse, it might be hard to be open to that degree without feeling engulfed and smothered and intruded upon. So there's there's some nuances to navigate there. And my, my second thought there is I, I actually see a see an experiment set up there. And, and I hope saying that doesn't make it sound like I'm trivializing what you're going through, but here, here's the experiment I see. You're, you're asking for, I wanna know the little things. And my husband and his therapist are afraid that that will keep me in my trauma. Great experiment. Yeah. Take me the little things and my job will be to not have my trauma ignited. Let me show you, I can hold that. I, I can be useful. Um, we can bond over that. Um, and I, I would say that that would be the place to start. Would you be willing to try it? I'll work on my end. You work on the transparency. I'll work on my end where um, I'm not going to um, overload you or myself with my feelings or my reaction. And I'm not, I'm not saying that those things are bad. Again, you got to think in relational space. What is natural and normal for me may have a completely different story for you. So I see this all the time with like the way that anger and intensity gets expressed in relationships. Um, you know, you hear families, no, we're not angry, we're passionate. I, I actually think that that can be true a lot of the times, but if, if you get passionate in that way with someone who grew up in a home that was really quiet and really avoidant, they may have a hard time distinguishing between passion and anger. So when, when I say you work on your side, I'm not saying it is bad. I'm saying you're, you're, you're working with a partner who might shy away from that amount of transparency for an understandable reason. And it's the job of the coupleship to work out and negotiate how can we find what's best for us. So that, that's what I see right there is, you know, there's a, give me a trial run on this. Let's see how, let's make an agreement and let's see how it goes. I think that's one of the best ways to start approaching, um, there's something that I would like to get or something I'd like to experience that you're not immediately on board for. Is you set up an agreement and then you work to keep it. That's that I would say um, more, more so than show me everything and, and I'll feel connected. And again, that, it's not that that's not uh, helpful, but I think trust is built on agreements. It doesn't matter how we feel. Here's how we're going to treat each other. Here's what we're going to do. It doesn't matter what we're afraid of. Here's what we've deigned to bring to our relationship space. So that's, that's my thoughts on that one. Yeah, John, do you think it would be helpful for this couple to do some exploration of attachment styles and love languages to find out? Because it sounds like, you know, we're, yeah, we're doing well, this. And I see, I see all the time, you know, if, if this were my legacy, my, my contribution to the recovery community for my career, I'd be really happy if this point got across. Sobriety doesn't fix everything and attachment styles are not related. I mean, it, attachment styles are not healed or changed through addiction recovery. Our attachment style is what it is. And again, a lot of, a lot of couples run into problems with each other because they don't understand who they've got. Um, some attachment styles, like I'll, I'll use, you know, Stan Tatkin's um, definitions here, a more islandish person is always going to struggle with transparency. And it's not because they're bad or sick or anything like that. It's just, it's how they're set up. And someone who might be more wavish is going to struggle with the lack of transparency. And it's not because they're neurotic or bad or, or right. It's just, it's a difference that has to be navigated. So I, I see some spaces here that are more, it comes more from the relational space than an individual preference, which if, if you're getting into a relationship struggle, it's always best to frame it up as a relationship issue that both of us can come forward and say, okay, I'm game. Let's, let's stretch. Let's try some things. Yeah, yeah. Let's fight the problem, not each other. Um, yep. Well said. So. Um, okay. Um, validation is a great long time subject. Thank you, John.
Yes, thank you, John. I will reiterate that. Um, I tried, this is from an addict who gave disclosure in October. So we're, you know, half a year out from that, uh, give or take. Um, I try very hard not to justify or explain when my partner questions me or her triggers are pushed. Um, what can I do to work on this? I love that you want to work on this, John. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, there's um, there's a really helpful bar to belly up to. I know I'm struggling here. I'd like to do better. So I would say um, just the facts, please uh, have that be your mantra. Um, it's really, really hard, especially when we know that the information we're presenting will get assessed and analyzed and there will be conclusions made by the person we're giving the information to. Um, I, I think a division of labor is really important here. Um, your job as the person who is trying to be accountable and and um, answering questions when your partner is triggered, your job is not to provide the analysis and not to come to the conclusions at all. Your job is to give raw data and raw data only. So watch for the part of you that wants to present it in a way so that your partner is more inclined to come up with the conclusion that you want especially a triggered, betrayed partner, they're going to smell that from 100 miles away and they're going to call manipulation and they're going to be right about that, whether you intended to be manipulated or not. So really work on just, I'm just giving the facts and whatever conclusions or assessments that you make, that is the next thing that we're going to engage with. Um, so take it one step at a time. Don't try to, don't try to be efficient here. Um, I think oftentimes in relationships and emotions, our, our quest for efficiency really comes at a cost of you know, feeling validated, held, valued. So that, that's what I would say there is work on just giving the facts and stopping short. And sometimes it's going to feel like I'm, I'm not I'm not being artful in my communication with you. Don't don't go for artfulness again. Go for here's what happened. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's just the answer to your question. And I would say the more brief, the better to a degree. So if you struggle with brevity, don't try to get it like two sentences to three words. But if part of the problem you're running into is you give your partner this whole narrative and they're getting more and more activated. That's probably because there's a lot of anxiety and assumptions built in the gaps between solid information. So work on just getting really concise, here's the information. It's always easier to give more to help support than it is to take back the extra fluff that annoys or hurts or confuses our partner. Um, is it helpful, uh, and I, I agree with like, were you ogling that waitress? No, I wasn't. Is it helpful to then say, given my past history, I can understand why you might be wondering, you know, give them a little bit of validation. I can understand where you're coming from. Yeah, there, there's the validation of the, the partner. There's the validation of the person. I totally know why you would struggle with this. I can see that and I can even own. Um, I'm, I'm not asking you to struggle any less with this. In fact, if, if you weren't struggling with this, I'd, I'd be shocked. I'd be worried. Yeah, but stop the mansplaining. <laughs> just just stop the mansplaining. Doesn't help. Yep. No, not yeah, not not your job to give analysis, just the facts. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, okay, next one. I can't understand how my husband doesn't realize he has lost years with us. He is like a deer in the headlights. He literally is lost. Um, constant validation from anyone. It sounds like with an explanation explanation. I think that's what he needs, or she's saying he needs. Um, he is mother and mesh, possibly father too. Sexually abuse, sexual abuse started by eight uh, by his sister. Um, it's so hard. He's up and then down. Uh, he just can't tell the truth. Um, always getting caught. Is there more to this? Okay, I don't see any more. But um, so some some of the finer point that Dr. Adams and I have been getting on our understanding of enmeshment is that. Um, it is not a secondary issue to addiction or anything else. It, it's, it's its own main course. It's its own primary issue. And all over in this, what I'm reading is um, there is undealt with, if, if there's enmeshment going on here, so much of this could be explained by that. So um, what I would say to that, have him give me a call. Yeah. Um, let's get him support on that. 
Um, what we've heard, we, we interviewed a bunch of people who have been through our program in the last 10 years. And what we've heard again and again is I could not make progress on my sexual addiction, my relationship recovery until my enmeshment recovery was locked in. Yeah. And so I, I see here one, one way of looking at enmeshment issues. It's, it's the little overwhelmed boy that is sent to handle everything, which is, you know, that's the essence of enmeshment. And I see a lot of that in what you're saying there. So, um, like, on, honestly, have him give me a call. Um, send me an email. Yeah. Um, we, we can get the right kind of support there. And over time, we can see that dynamic change for sure. Yeah, you can Google White Pine Recovery, which is John's treatment facility. Um, and John and Ken uh, Adams give uh, both in-person and online enmeshment work groups. They can work with you directly, depending on where you are. Um, and they are absolutely the best. So um, I want to validate, because he has lost years with us. Do you mind if I tell a story about myself? Yeah, no, please. Um, I didn't understand that until I was about 10 years sober. And um, my mother sent me a shoebox full of pictures. Um, they were downsizing. And... Um, it was a shoebox and most of the pictures were of me. So she just sent them. Um, and um, in this shoebox, you know, the old school envelopes with the negatives and the prints and, you know, and I pulled one out kind of at random and it was Christmas of 1999, which is the very height of and end of my addiction. Um, at that point I was living in LA. My sister was an hour South of me in Orange County. My parents were still in Indiana where I grew up. My sister had a three-year-old and a brand new baby. Um, and she wanted all of us to come out, celebrate the new baby, the three-year-old's old enough to understand Christmas. Rudolph, present, you know. Um, you know, joyous family time. So Christmas Eve, we went, we had dinner, we hung out, went to midnight mass, which is like you know, 10.30 or whatever. And then afterward, instead of staying at the McMansion in Orange County, I said, you know, I'm only an hour away, I'm gonna sleep in my own bed. Um, so, of course, I did not go home and go to sleep. I got high and drove around and looked for prostitutes all night because, you know, was, that was my MO. Um, and then I went home home at about 5.30 and took a shower and changed clothes and drove back down to Orange County and did Christmas, um, you know, all of that with no sleep. And I never thought anything about it. I was there, right? Um, in this envelope of pictures, I was there physically. But I could see in my eyes that I was not there. I was not present. And it just killed me. I was like, oh, my God, how much of life have I missed? You know, not only did I cheat myself, I cheated people who love me. I cheated them because I was physically there, but not mentally there. And this is something that addicts struggle to understand sometimes is you know when we're physically there but not emotionally there we're not there and people notice um so i want to validate uh the questioners saying he doesn't realize he's lost years with us um he has and hopefully he'll come around to that at some point i have i have yet to meet someone who struggles with addiction who experienced deep emotional consistent presence yeah and so as you tell that story, Scott, I, you know, it makes me think of one of the mantras that comes out of my, that's come out of my own recovery, which is I'm experiencing things now that I didn't even know existed. I wouldn't even known to ask for this. Yeah. And that whole, like, I can see it in my eyes. I wasn't there. I, I don't think I would have been able to detect that in a picture of myself until probably three or four years post sobriety and solid recovery because there's this there's this side of like emotional presence and like connection and intimacy that it's not an intellectual concept you don't get it unless you start experiencing it um i really appreciate you i really appreciate you sharing that yeah and that was about 10 years into recovery so it was blatantly obvious to me but yeah i would not have recognized it at the one year mark for sure i'd yeah. be like oh cute pictures you know move on um um, next one, can you talk about what invalidation sounds like? Sure. So 
in 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 the spirit of what I presented here today, one form of invalidation I would say would be crossing the wires. So somebody comes to you with a big emotion, and um, rather than focusing on invalidating you as a person, you matter to me. You're worthwhile to me. Um, setting aside what's being said and believed, I'm here with you. Um, that would be crossing wires in two ways, which invalidation can sound like, tell me why you feel that way, um, which is, is not a bad question, but I think rarely is it delivered with real curiosity. It's more of a challenge. The other part of invalidation would be, you know, remember that first form of validation, um, the legalistic to prove the truth or validity. Only the person who's seeking it can do that. So if you take that job, let me tell you why that's not valid. Or, or well, did you think about blah, blah, blah? Um, that's invalidation. Um, I think anything short of um, what is happening right here matters to me because it's you. Anything short of showing that, saying that, um, that would be invalidation. Um, and there's, there, I mean, there's really blatant, uh, you're, you're just wrong, or I can't accept you feel that way. Um, again, I, I think those responses, I can understand where they come from. It's this urgency to make this feeling and this dynamic that's going on, this urgency to make that die. Um, but it flies in the face of what feelings are. Feelings aren't facts. They're not supposed to be. So if you argue feelings like facts, you're invalidating. Um, if you are dogged in, because I can't understand how you feel that way or what you're seeing or where you're coming from. It can't be like, again, talk, talk to your therapist and maybe even use the term my narcissism <laughs> because that's what that is. If I can't wrap my head around it, it must not be real. And, and I, and I see this, I'll, I'll just tell two short uh, examples. I see this going both ways in couples where there's been betrayal. So um, just the other week I was working with a couple and she said to him he had betrayed her she said to him my body doesn't let me uh give you affection relax around you all the time even when i want to and his response to that is, it doesn't work that way it's a choice and i said whoa, whoa whoa time out like that is one of the most significant things that's ever come on the lap of this relationship let's work on it and um so there can be this real invalidation from the betrayer to the betrayed I don't understand your experience. It doesn't make sense. Therefore, it must not be true. And, and just the other way, um, you, you want to feel, you want to get two people feeling crazy. You have someone who struggles with addiction, try to explain to someone who does not struggle with addiction, what that feels like. Um, what, what, and early on in my career, I had one spouse say to me, I was doing an intake with, with both this husband and wife. And um, she said, I need to know whether he's an addict or just an a-hole. And um, I, I said, fortunately, there's an assessment that can show us, um, you know, we, we can answer that question. But there was a lot of like, even as it was, it was diagnosed, it was addiction, there was a lot of but wait, 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 why would a person do that? And it's, it's the beauty of going to 12 step meetings, only, only someone who has been on the inside of ad addiction can understand what it's like for an addict. So in invalidation comes in a lot of different forms. Um, I hope I hope those are some good examples. Yeah, I think they're great. Um, I'm going to reword this next question a little bit. Um, is it harder to validate someone if, as a child, you weren't validated? You were not validated. Sure, and I, I would say there's a lot of like healthy relationship skills that are hard to do if you didn't experience it because they're not. It's not like. It's it's not it's not the kind of skill like I know how to take apart an engine and put it back together. It's not. It, it's more of a feeling thing. I recently had uh, someone who I was doing a, an enmeshment consult with say to me, "It's when it gets to this feeling type stuff, I really struggle. Give me a discrete problem, and I'm I'm good. But it's this feeling type stuff I struggle with. So yeah, gr growing up where the feeling type stuff is not practiced, it's not out there." You just don't develop a felt sense for it. So yeah, it's it's really, really difficult, I think, to provide that when you weren't, because you may think, you know, I'm I'm providing validation because I'm doing the legalistic thing. Let's prove this is right. And I'm missing the whole point where your personhood matters more than your perspective or your performance. 
Um, people who don't grow up in families like that, just it's not in their bones. They don't get it. They have to learn it. Yeah, great. Um, how do I move past my partner's initial defensiveness and impulsive reactive response? To me, this feels like his initial reaction is how he truly feels. And it's hard for me to trust and believe that the do-over response is more authentic. Um, I'm able to do this a few times, but it seems like this is how it goes in most interactions when I bring up my feelings and needs. Um, the apology is not my intention and I didn't mean to hurt you, feel empty and unauthentic, especially when this happens repeatedly with no change. Yeah, so so this brings to mind for me parts. Um, I, I think it can be completely true that the first response is part, is, is how part of him feels. It could be completely authentic and true in that sense. And I, I can really empathize here with the I don't have I don't have it in me to try too many times um, in the wrong because it's confusing. So um, and that that it's hard to accept the apologies when there's not change. So there's a piece there that a lot of times in relationships I'll see there's this dynamic that keeps happening again and again, and we have to learn how to get supportively confrontational with each other. And and by that I mean like in this situation, hey. Um, I appreciate your willingness to apologize. I appreciate your willingness to come back on this, but I'm, I'm starting to get concerned that it's the same things you're apologizing for again and again. Um, would you be willing, would you be willing to put a focus on just that thing, really hunker down on that, work to understand that and change that? Um, that that's what I mean by supportively confrontational is um, we have to have an ability in our relationships to speak to the problems that are happening in our relationship. Um, I know my, my spouse and I have used this with each other before and you know the, the willingness to accept I think comes more out of our agreement than is it authentic. We, we, we have been known to say to each other, oh, do you wanna try that again? Do you wanna say that again? Um, because yeah, oftentimes, especially when emotions are high, my first draft response is not coming from the relational part of me. It's coming from a scared, defensive, one yeah. person thinking part of me. And those parts of me are real. They're not going anywhere. Um, so again, the agreement is we're we're gonna we're gonna enter this system thinking as a two person system. So if we don't hit the mark, we're gonna say to each other, "You want to do over? You want to you want to get the two person part of you here?" Yeah. Um, but again, that's that's not a mandate. That's an option. Um, but I would I would definitely work on that supportive confrontation. Would you be willing to work on this? Yeah. And for the addict who I, I hope is either listening now or will listen later, um, you know, I am someone. My natural reaction, first reaction, is to defend uh, always. Um, and you talk about this repeatedly. We talked about it um, when you discussed apologies a couple of months ago. Um, you talked about it a little bit today. Sometimes we have to slow it down. Um, sometimes the best response is, I know I need to apologize, but I'm not there right now. <laughs> and sometimes the apology happens the next day and it's real. Um, same thing with validation. Sometimes it's like, I, I know you want some validation. I need to wrap my head around this. Can I, you know? Um, because our first here. reaction is often the angry little boy part of us, at, or at least in my case, who feels put upon and manipulated and unheard. And, you know, so I get defensive. Um, so, yeah, and, and I agree with John. It is a real response, but it's only part of the response. The rest of me has a better response, I hope. So, yeah. I think that's actually what provides the trust in, in a relationship is not, are you devoid of these um, anti-relational parts or these parts that can hurt me? It's, are you committed? Are you committed to uh, rearranging those so that those are not the parts that I am primarily in a relationship with? Um, yeah. um, okay, I'm getting some funny questions. I don't know, John, if you've been seeing them. From oh I I I've been responding to them you know, you'll hear about them later. Okay. <laughs> um, my husband and I did I do yeah, I'm not going to say uh, my husband and I just had our second discovery after four years. Um, he has been actively acting out for almost two years, and I didn't know. 
He said, I felt like I could be a good husband and then it would matter if I was in my addiction. Um, those words replay in my mind. He claims now that he is going to be 100% focused on his recovery. But after that statement, uh, you know, she's, she's confused. Uh, everyone says actions speak louder than words. But, is, is, but if his actions are good husband, uh, how do I know to learn the difference? You know, but how do I, you know, if he's otherwise being a good husband, how can this individual know if he's acting out or not? Yeah, the big the big thing that I would, uh, if I were in your position or if, if I was the marriage therapist here, what I would say needs to be gotten at is this belief. I, I actually, I, I don't like the term here, good husband. And don't get me wrong, that's a guiding star for me. But just as it, I would say more importantly, is a good partner too. It doesn't matter if we're married or not. It doesn't matter if, it, like, it's not about me. It's about what you're experiencing. So yeah. this, like, if I could be a good husband, it wouldn't matter if I'm in my addiction. To you, no. To your partner who says your addiction betrays me, it absolutely matters. It doesn't, it yeah. doesn't matter how how you're treating or showing up on a day-to-day -day basis. If If the undercurrent is betrayal, like, that's not being a good partner to your partner. So that that's what I would say. That That's the piece that needs to get rooted out. And you right. two will have to figure out some ways to be able to demonstrate how the belief system is held. Because, and that this isn't a judgment on your spouse at all. It's a very self-contained, self-centered view there. Yeah. If I feel like I'm being a good husband, if you think I'm being a good husband, then we've got bases covered and it doesn't matter what else I do. Um, yeah. that's not relational. Yeah. Especially after your partner has made it clear, hey, when you betray me in this way, it doesn't you're not being a good partner to me. Um, so that's there's a belief system that has to be looked at and rearranged there. And um that that's not going to lend itself to um here's my external behaviors. Like there, there's gonna have to be some supported uh, exploration of the for the two of you on what what is the current belief system that um, my partner and I both hold. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if I say I'm being a good husband, to me that is a one person system. Yeah. If I think I'm doing well and the neighbors think I'm doing well, then everything's okay. A uh, two persons a relationship is two people. You know. Yeah. I've, I've had, I've had partners say to me before, um, you know, my, my addicted struggling spouse says we have a good relationship. I don't feel like it's a good relationship. Who should I believe? And, and the question just boggles my mind a little bit. I can understand why it's asked, but it boggles my mind a little bit. Why, why on earth, when it comes to like your part of this relationship, why on earth would you, would you discount your feelings and just say, well, if you say it's good, it's good. Um, that that's that's the two person thinking that's necessary is at, at the end of the day it doesn't matter how good of a husband i think i am um it doesn't matter about how good of a partner i think i am um that's only part of it you, you got to remember you're a partner to somebody and their opinion of how you're doing really really matters um okay what is a good thing to say to an addict who says i don't feel good about myself isn't he in choice if he chooses to, I guess, not feel good about himself? Um, why does he say that? What would be a mature answer? So the addict says, I don't feel good about myself. How do we handle this? So, so, so because we talked about validation today, let's talk about validation. Yeah. Um, I think the mature response is, is not a fix. I think that's really hard to hear from somebody that you love, somebody that you care about. I don't feel good about myself. You validate the person. I'm sorry, that looks like it hurts. Um, how, how do you feel about that? How, how's that working out for you? Um, I hope you can find some relief to that. That seems like that would be miserable. Um, because, again, that that's not... That, that feeling, I don't feel good about myself. I think that's a statement of fact, not a statement of perspective. So from the outside, you can't change that. You can't alter that. Um, it's not your job as a partner either to do that. So 
I, I would say on that one, um, look at the kind of space you can open up for acknowledgement and validation. That, that is the fact. That's where your partner's starting from. Um, any nudge you want to give, I would say, I hope I hope you're talking to somebody about that. I hope I hope that's part of your work in 12 steps. I hope that's part of your work with your therapist. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry you're feeling trapped in that. Yeah, and, and you know, I don't feel good about myself. It's a shame statement. You know, it, it's I'm not good enough, but there's something inherently wrong with me. I'm defective, I've damaged goods. It's not, I did a bad thing. I feel bad about it. I want to change it. I am bad. So to heck with this. <laughs> I'm just going to stay here. Um, you know, the addict, uh, again, I'll, you know, I'm the addict. I'm the shame-based person here. Um, you got to work through this shame. Um, it's very hard. I have poor beliefs about myself. Um, you know, shame comes from childhood trauma for the most part. Um, and it gives us what we call negative core beliefs. They're usually lies. I mean, some of my core beliefs are I'm not allowed to have feelings. I'm certainly not allowed to express them. Um, you know, what other people think of me matters more than how I feel about myself. Um, and the big one is if I show you the truth about me, you will run away. You will reject me. You will make fun of me. Um, you, you will not be able to get away from me fast enough. Those, I mean, that those are shame statements. They play in my head. I know they're lies. Um, but I, I mean, what is your advice, John, to an addict who's rattling around with shame statements? I mean, what should the addict be doing here? Actually, I, I went a little bit different, Scott, with that. I don't feel good about myself. And in, instead of, I love Brene Brown's work, but I actually don't like her distinction between guilt and shame. Yeah. I, I, I like, I think P. Melody talks about healthy shame and unhealthy shame. I like that distinction yeah. a little bit better because I've actually said this really recently. I don't feel good about myself. And um, if I can identify real reasons. So, you know, lately, one of the reasons I don't feel good about myself, I don't feel good in my own skin. I'm not moving enough. I can feel that in my body. Like I, right. I'm not getting what I need. That doesn't feel good. That's actually really helpful to identify. And as I've been, again, this really discreet thing that I can work on that has nothing to do with my worth as a person, as I've worked on that, I felt better in my own skin. Um, versus the, I don't feel good about myself. Uh, tell me why. Oh, because I'm a piece of crap. Like that shame that has to be worked on. Yeah. And I, I would say how I most often challenge this with the folks that I work with is, could you imagine um, saying that to your child? I don't feel good about you because you're a piece of crap. Could you imagine saying that to your child? If the answer is no, you shouldn't have that going on inside. It's it's no better for you than it would be for you to say that for your child. So it's part of that ongoing pervasive. We have to learn how to care for ourselves. We have to learn how to show up for ourselves in recovery. And that's that's part of the hard work. I have a harsh inner critic. Yeah. Um, we are out of time. We're also out of questions. Um, Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, John, for a great topic. I will get this posted as quickly as I can. Um, anything you want to say to take us out, John? Um, appreciate everyone being here. Next next time is symposium weekend, so I won't be available, but we'll see it. We'll see each other again in in May. Okay, I will. Um, I'll take the two weeks from now off the schedule. Okay, great. Thank you, Thank you everybody. We'll see you in a month. Bye.